Ajay Jha, along with my ACS colleagues, uh, Dr. Diksha Gupta, Dr. Kaushik Natarajan, and Dr. Mihaj Jha. Welcome you to this ACS Science Talk session. Just to update you on the upcoming ACS Science Talk, please visit our ACS in India webpage and register for the upcoming sessions. We have also uploaded the past lecture recordings on the ACS Science Talk virtual library. Feel free to visit, like, subscribe, and share among the scientific community. To keep you updated with the latest research findings and the project lo product launches at ACS, we have a monthly newsletter, ACS Insights India. Subscribe today for free. We'll provide the link into the chat box later. And to begin with the scientific session, it's a pleasure and honor to have Professor Saurabh Pal with us. Professor Pal is a JC Bose Fellow and Director of the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Kolkata. He obtained his doctorate from the IACS Kolkata in 1985. Later, he worked as a postdoctoral associate at University of Florida between 1986 to 87. Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the University of Heidelberg in 1987 and visiting professor at the Institute of Molecular Science, Okazaki, Japan in 1997. He has served as a professor and institute chair professor of IIT Bombay between 2015 to 2017. Before this role, he was the director of CSIR in Sil Pune between 2010 to 2015 and also held the position of director additional charge CSIR, CSM, CRI, Bhavnagar. At CSIR in Sil Pune, he was also the head of physical and materials chemistry department. His research interests are focused on the theoretical investigation of hard soft acid base relation, study of electron molecule scattering, development and application of molecular dynamics, along with the application to problems of chemical physics and computational material science. Professor Pal has a long list of awards and accolades to his credit. To mention a few, the SS Bhatnagar Prize in Chemical Science in 2000, Astra CNR Raw Award in Chemistry and Material Science in 2014, INSA Young Scientist Award in 1987, CSIR Young Scientist Award in 1989, and many more. He is an elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. He has also served on the editorial boards of several journals of international repute. Before Professor Pal starts his lecture, a couple of instructions for the audience. We request the audience to post their questions into the Q&A tab. Please avoid putting questions into the chat box. And in case of any internet interruptions, please stay with us. Now I would like to invite Professor Pal to deliver his talk. I'll stop sharing the screen from my side. Professor Pal, please. Yeah, thank you. Am I audible? Yes, Professor Pal, loud and clear. Okay. I see a couple of people raising hands. I didn't understand. So if they want to say something before I start. Or... Saying hello to you. Yeah, hello, yeah, hello to everybody. Uh, quite a large number of my friends and students and collaborators who are joined. I, I begin first, of course, by welcoming you all and uh, thanking the ACS uh, for inviting me. Uh, Diksha Gupta, who's leading the ACS India and several of my colleagues in the ACS India. Indeed, I consider it a great honor uh, to give this ACS science talks. The, the time, during the time of the pandemic, these virtual ACS science talks have become a very important part of the calendar. And I think they have been able to bring uh, extremely good people to give this talk. So I'm, I'm very delighted and honored to be here uh, and invi be invited by the ACS. I think with this, uh, may I now share the screen, right? So, is it being seen? No, Principal, uh, could you please repeat again? All right. So I will share the screen. Okay, and now let's see. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. Kindly make it full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much again, once again, for inviting me and thanks to all those who have joined from various parts of the world. Uh, I'm very happy to be giving this talk on this ACS platform. And the title of the talk is uh, Com First Principle Computational Chemistry 
from molecules to materials. Uh, I have something in my panel which I'm trying to remove. that anyway so uh so let me first uh, say that uh, i am at uh, the indian institute of science education in the south kolkata and this is uh, the campus of isar kolkata uh, which is spread over to 201 acres and however my talk today will span uh, my working at in the three cities, uh, mainly in the National Chemical Laboratory in Pune, and then at the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai or Bombay, where I spent a relatively short time and now in Nysar, Kolkata. So many of the people who have joined have been associated with me in these three cities. So I thought I will give a photograph of these three cities, uh, which is very typical of uh, those cities. Uh, I should first say a little bit, take a little time to talk about ISR Kolkata because it's an institute uh, of uh, relatively recent times. Uh, it is an institute of national importance. It is set up to have an integrated research with education and the flagship program is essentially the undergraduate BSMS program. Uh, the whole idea of this undergraduate science program is to impart interdisciplinary research with education. Of course, apart from this undergraduate program, we also have postgraduate PhD programs of different types. In a decade and a half, we have now spent about more than 15 years. The, all the ICERs have become a brand name and there are seven of them in this country and Kolkata was one of the first two to be set up in 2006, along with ISAR Pune. So I'm very happy uh, that this institute is doing well and it is competing very favorably with many institutions which came up at this time. Uh, let me also say that today, uh, when uh, this slide is shown, it is not out of place for the computational chemistry. This slide essentially shows the importance of uh, fundamental science along with the importance of application and the Pasteur quadrant, uh, the Louis Pasteur, very famous Louis, Pasteur, Louis Pasteur's quadrant actually uh, symbolizes use inspired basic research. So that is the whole idea. That is where we want to go. And this seems to be so much translational that people thought that the computational chemistry has no role. But today computational chemistry has positioned itself such that one can actually come or one can use this in terms of the transmission research. The computational chemistry is very hard to say when does the theory and computational chemistry start. The modern theoretical chemistry of course started with the advent of quantum mechanics, but I must say about G. N. Lewis who actually looked at the structure of the atoms and molecules, very famous book that he wrote, The Valence and the Structure of Atoms and Molecules, and who defined physical chemistry as encompassing everything that is interesting. The G.N. Lewis, of course, did his chemical, the first uh, idea of the chemical bond, which obviously was not quantum mechanical, but really very successfully described many chemical bonds from covalent to ionic to coordinate and so on. So this chemical bond is uh, all pervasive. It is the heart of chemistry and the chemical bonds eventually are formed because they lower the potential energy between the charged particles that are So a very simple idea, but what is interesting to note that G. N. Lewis really did not work on this field after the advent of quantum mechanics. And in fact, Linus Pauling was the person who actually looked, uh, took up this idea of octet and eventually he had a full blown balance bond theory. Today, of course, computational chemistry has come a long way. Long way, even from the valence bond theory of uh, Linus Pauling or Heitler in London. Today, it is mostly based on molecular orbitals. And the focus today, of course, would be on the quantum mechanical methods where we solve the Schrodinger equation. Uh, of course, 
in most cases we'll solve the time independent Schrodinger equation and this is done by the quantum mechanical method and this is the idea of the computational quantum chemistry uh, but I must say that today computational chemistry is, is a much wider has a much wider reach by molecular mechanics which I'm not going to describe which is basically atomistic simulation or coarse graining uh, where you do uh, a beads composing a few atoms and then one uses classical mecha classical mechanics like Newton's law and molecular dynamics to actually describe the, the, the motion. But a third category is also very important to describe that is called completely empirical or statistical. And that is basically the QSAR, quantum quantitative structure activity relationship and various types of this kind, which are used in clinical and pharmaceutical chemistry. So I would say mostly quantum mechanical and classical uh, simulations and empirical or statistical means which can also include today artificial intelligence and machine learning in all of these uh, really compose of what is computational chemistry. And so it's a very, very uh, wide reach and it's almost impossible to cover all of computational chemistry in this short time. Obviously what I'm going to cover is an overview of the type of computational chemistry that I'm doing and to kind of state what is the reach of the computational chemistry. Uh, so I want to uh, state this very clearly that today computational chemistry or the computation has come as one very important arm in the solution to the problem. So you have theory, experiment and computation. I again distinguish little bit between theory and computation. Although these two hands must go one to one, must go together, but in principle, the theory is somewhat different from computation. So theory is when you develop computation, when you apply a developed theory for chemical problems. So I just want to state this because there is a large number of students who are here. So I'm just trying to state a few things because people sometimes get confused between these two. So when you say computational chemistry, the theory is an integral part, but probably it tells more than just telling the theory. And today, of course, computational chemistry means computers, but one has to remember that it, there was a theoretical chemistry even before computers really came. And in a big way, Heitler and London, of course, arguably the first paper in quantum chemistry. And I, I want to keep this paper in Zeitstrafe for physics, which was basically the chemical bond of the hydrogen molecule. Then, you know, it, it is very difficult to tell, I select only a few landmark work, but I'm trying to do at the cost of you know, being criticized, that's something I missed out. Born Oppenheimer's molecule, a very, very important work of Born and Oppenheimer, which actually set the, the solution of the Schrodinger equation in a fixed nuclei approximation. Then Huckel's early calculations is a very, very important landmark paper. And then of course came Mulliken with his molecular orbitals and lots of electronic structure and Mulliken wrote a lot of papers. I've just cited one of them. As you can see, this the 11th in the series of electronic structure of molecules, where it defined electron affinity, molecular orbital, dipole moments, a lot of work that the Mulliken did, and all these before the computers came in the big way. It continues with the Pauling valence bond of Paulings and Slater's work with Mulliken is very, very famous, and Linus Pauling. I told you Pauling, of course, wrote this nature of chemical bond, and, and John C. Slater talked about directed valence and so on. So they had a lot of interesting discussion, debates in the early days. And of course, by the same time, in the 1930s, people started talking of hybridization. Again, something that is probably in the molecular orbital theory today is absent. Today, we don't have to talk about hybridization separately, but I think there's a lot of interesting chemistry that was done with the hybridization. And, and Charles Coulson, another very, very famous name, Coulson and Muffet, a very significant paper in the philosophical magazine. Uh, Bond's theory of liquid. This is again, a very interesting paper in theoretical chemistry. And of course, Eiling's transition state theory, again, back in 1935, when he talked of the activated complex in chemical reactions. I must quote here, 1939, Linus Pauling's book on the nature of the chemical bond. In fact, there are several books which have come. By the time 1940s came, 
the computers came in a very big way. And of course, it's again, very hard to identify which is the first computer work. And I can only say that the molecular, in terms of molecular simulation, one of the top work at that time in 1953, Metropolis algorithm, the first molecular simulation in computer. Ruthan did a lot of work along with Hall. In fact, they had, they had these works on 1951 where Ruthan actually introduced what is called the basis set and the Hall's work on molecular orbital theory and chemical valency. They actually had a lot of computers and this is when the computers really started coming. And I must say today, that the Ruthan's work was a seminal work because it actually brought in the concept of the LCAO MO, which has made many molecular calculations facile. At the same time, the, the Pi, the Dewar's and Longwood-Hagen's work on the proceedings of physical society, on the Pi era, the basically description of very simple chemical description based on the Pi electrons were being done. Carr and Parinello, I must say, very interesting work in 1985, where they unified the molecular dynamics and DFT. DFT, of course, by this time, became a very, very important tool in the electronic structure theory. Then Carr plus uh, dynamics of folded proteins. In fact, all of us know that Carr plus eventually got the Nobel Prize. Chandler's transition state theory. And at the same time, uh, the couple cluster, I must mention, uh, became the gold standard of, of electronic structure quantum chemistry. And I, this I must mention about couple cluster as a very, very important uh, in the history of theoretical chemistry. Of course, couple cluster came when the computers have already come. Uh, I must say at the same time, uh, Huffman and Woodward wrote very interesting paper, the conservation of orbital symmetry, some basic rules to avoid the computer, Peter Poulet, I must mention here Peter Poole. Uh, he did a seminal work on the gradients. In fact, many of many of many of us know that today, when you look at geometry optimization, or even particularly geometry optimization, or even properties and so on, Poole's gradients are among uh, the most important part of the work. And Poole did 1969. Fukui's intrinsic reaction coordinates, and of course, Warsaw's UMMM, which actually built again for the Nobel Prize. Uh, Warsha Levitt, very, very famous paper, which, which, which got the Nobel Prize in, 19, in 2013. Uh, so eventually the central theme of the computational chemistry is uh, structure, dynamics, and reactivity. So these are the three major part of the computational chemistry. And, and somehow there were a lot of connection with the biology. I must mention here, Although I'm not going to talk of computational biology, but computational biology and computational chemistry have many tools which are very similar. The central dogma in the molecular biology is, of course, the same structure dynamics, the reactivity is just called function, with sequencing and the evaluation cap on the top and the bottom. So I think the molecular biology also uses many of these. Unfortunately, the biology systems are big enough that it is not the quantum chemist, quantum mechanics, but very often. The other parts of the simulation, like atomistic or coarse graining, which is taken. I must also mention here that within the quantum chemistry, there are several methods. And this is just a kind of a qualitative curve. So, this is the inaccuracy. When I say accuracy, it means error bar from 0 0.1 kilocalorie to a very large error bar. Uh, and, 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 and you can see how the size and the accuracy. Uh, changes. So if I have very large size, we actually use less accurate methods with a much larger error bar. So of course, this is just an indicative scale. This is not the numbers and the numbers keep changing because the computers are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I must share this slide because this is the slide which actually tells all of the methods in different length scale. And today, uh, this is a slide which is, of course, well known to many of many of us. Uh, it starts from the quantum mechanics to atomistic, mesoscale simulation, on, on to an engineering length scale. And this is what we are talking, uh, quantum mechanics, atomistic and mesoscale simulation. However, uh, my focus will be on our work, which is actually still on the quantum mechanics, although it will go, as I will say, from molecules to materials. But one has to realize that we have 
a suite of methods by which one can today simulate materials at different length scales, from a very small length scale to very large length scale. And that's the most important thing. You can go up to the macro scale simulation and it's, it's very good. What is very interesting theoretically is to really connect this. Can we start from quantum mechanics and explain the approximations in the atomistic simulations? That somehow has been done. Can we do the next from the atomistic to coarse grain? People are trying to do that. There's a lot of gray area. Can we go from the coarse grain into the engineering lens? Now that is that, as far as I know, there are almost very few attempts to do that. One has to remember that the engineering length scale was developed much earlier. This was known much, much earlier. It's a classical engineering. Then came the quantum, and then comes the middle ones, which are now developed. So the theoretical uh, challenge is to really understand how to construct these progressive approximations as the systems become larger and larger. Uh, I now change uh, gear to uh, the work that uh, we have been doing. Uh, so basically the various areas of work I want to list out, the electronic structure of molecules, uh, development, and this is very uh, new, the development of bound state methods to resonance and decay problem. All of us know that these are basically uh, non-bound, unbound states, but we have been trying to develop with, you know, a few other groups are also doing in the world. Uh, in the beginning, we were working on many body methods for molecular properties various molecular properties and energies. Uh, in between, I also worked on a non-iterative approximation of density functional response for large systems. Then we worked a lot on the descriptors, which is basically very qualitative, hard soft acid based reactivity of molecules. And several interesting things in the materials, like looking at zeolite catalysis, metal aromatic, anti-aromatic, hydrogen storage, gold and aluminum clusters, and very recently, CO2 reduction uh, with my collaborator uh, uh, using pincer complex as a catalyst. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm going to pick up a few of them uh, just to show the width and the breadth of the computational chemistry. So I'll first start with the molecular quantum chemistry at the small molecule level. And of course, as I said, there are several interesting theories, ab initio theories, which are developed starting from Hartree Fock, molecular, uh, the, the MP, the myeloplasid based perturbation, configuration interaction, using pair natural orbitals, couple cluster, and I've been mentioning that I'm going to come to that, and various versions of multi reference theories, not just for the couple cluster, but for the perturbation, for the configuration. So, very general class of multi reference theories have been in great demand. Together, these uh, suit of theories can actually treat both static and the dynamic electron correlation very appropriately. And that's a very interesting part. So for very small molecules, you have lots of ideas. I'm going to come up with challenges. Are we finished in the electronic structure of small molecules? I'm going to come to that at the end. In between, of course, which are sometimes called the ab initio theories, but more correctly, they are not ab initio theories, uh, density functional theories. They are very simple tools because they rely not on the wave function, but on the density, and they have been used for very large molecules and materials. In fact, towards the second part of my talk, I'm going to use the DFT application in the materials. I must also mention that when you do the quantum chemistry, we are usually using the atom-centered Gaussian bases, which are atom-centered, at Gaussian, not Slater. And there is a lot of history on that, how, why this Slater has not been used. And, uh, and I can only say for the student that the Gaussian is used for computational simplicity because the product of the Gaussians based on two centers is another Gaussian. And if you have solids instead of molecules, you can use a periodic basis. So eventually these two type classes of basic bases are used and grafted with the quantum mechanics. I should very quickly, just in one slide, tell about the cluster expansion or the couple cluster method, because that is something that I work, I have been working on for since, uh, since the beginning, and still we are working on this. So basically it has an exponential operator acting on a reference determinant, 
these operators T are basically excitation operators, one and one hole, one particle, two hole, two particle. Keeping this as a vacuum, the single reference determinant as a vacuum, they are all whole particle excitation, whole particle creation operators. And 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 with these, uh, the, the theory was developed very early by Jerry Chizek and later on by Chizek and Palders. And of course, there are several papers, and one of the first codes uh, came from the uh, Rod Bartlett's group, and there is a very interesting review uh, in 1981. Uh, I should just say, I have written it in hand. Uh, the way to solve this equation is actually, the most standard way to solve this equation is by similarity transformation. While you put the ground state as an exponential T based on a Hartree-Fock, and then you make a similarity transformation so that you get an if you get a model Hamiltonian acting on this reference, give you the total energy on the reference. So this is a very interesting idea. And then eventually, by projecting with the psi Hartree fog, you can get the total energy by projecting with all excited determinants, which are contained by the action of T operator on psi Hartree fog, you get an equation for the amplitude. The interesting part of this similarity transformed Hamiltonian is that it has a multi commutator series, and that makes it much easier uh, in terms of what is called the size extensivity. So, very interestingly, the size extensivity, which is basically the proper scaling of energy with the size of the system, is automatically guaranteed. And this is a very, very important feature of what I call dynamic correlation. In fact, I come to the dynamic correlation both static and dynamic. In the very early days, while this couple cluster was developed, we have been working on alternative forms of couple cluster to, for various reasons, particularly to have a flavor of stationary method, such that the energy derivatives can be obtained very easily, also for the molecular properties, and many times to even some higher order terms efficiently. As you can see, that this does not look like a variational theory. However, later on, one finds that through a lambda vector technique, you can actually get the same results as a stationary theory. So in fact, there is a lot of work on that. And that has been used by us uh, on the response of uh, energy. Uh, several versions are there. The lambda ve vector, algebra z vector, they are all very similar. They are the more explicit stationary forms. So two of the explicit, explicit stationary forms that I work on, or our group work on huh, was one is an a, a, a expectation value where the Hamiltonian uh, was transformed in a Hermitian manner, uh, which is basically a, a simple psi star h psi, an average value, uh, but this suffered from truncation errors. So we had to do what is called forced truncation. And this eventually led to the loss of size extensivity for which uh, we are propagating couple clusters. As I told you, couple cluster was size extensive, but unfortunately, uh, this uh, there is a loss of size extensivity if we use this. There are many other people. These are, of course, our work. I must say that wherever I have not given any names of authors, those are basically our group work. That is what I have tried to follow. Uh, for others' work, I have explicitly stated. So these are all our work at those very early days. But at the same time, I must say the Miro Urban and my friend Joseph Noga, they had been working on the very similar average value method. And of course, Rod Bartlett, they, they talked of this average value methods with a, which is truncated at the nth order of perturbation. We also came to another very interesting method, which is called the extended couple cluster, where we had to use an additional set of de excitation amplitude. It made it non Hermitian, but it was truncating. It was very interesting. In the context of the couple cluster, I must state that it is very hard to get a Hermitian theory which, which is fully truncated. And of course, that would have led to a very, very nice thing because everybody wants Hermitian theory. So this was explicitly non Hermitian, but the good thing was that it was a fully truncating and of course, size extensive. We can make it size extensive. Again, it started from your opponent's work and we continued to. I have been talking of the dynamic and static correlations. I should tell a little bit about what is the difference between these two. Uh, one of the major differences is, for example, if you look at a dissociation problem of hydrogen or let's say boron hydride, 
This can be actually taken care by a linear combination of more than one determinants. So for example, if you just take a restricted heart rate pulse, there's too much ionic component. So if you take a two configuration hydrogen molecule, of course, all of you know, if you take sigma g square and sigma u square, you can get it right. And that's an example of static correlation where there are few important determinants, not many, but only a few important determinants. And you can take care by linear combination. However, there are many others which have to be efficiently summed up because the number is too many. And that efficient summing up is not by linear combination. And that is called the dynamic correlation. In fact, this efficient summing up is actually done by what we did. That is basically the exponential summing up, not by linear expansion uh, here. So I, I have to say that that really is the dynamic correlation. So if you take a very linear expansion of what is called the configuration interaction, that can take care of static correlation well, but it is not efficient to take care of the dynamic correlation. So this is a very important part to realize that we need some kind of a combination of CI, which is a linear expansion, and a couple of cluster. And that has precisely been done today, uh, with a lot of, lot of, lot of co-workers have done this. A uh, lot of workers have done this. I must also say there have been efforts to take care of the static correlation in a single reference method. I must mention my friend, Ludwig Adam, Adam Oed, Piotr Pekush, Martin Headgarden, and several others who have been actually developing uh, work at, you know, to the extent that they can, they, they can be done. However, a more a glorified way of doing this would be through the multi-reference method. And multi-reference method including couple clusters. So this actually will take care of the static correlation. This will take care of the dynamic correlation. One can, one did a lot of work. We did a lot of work on ionization, electron affinity, excitation energy in the early days, first set of papers for Richard Mottet and Tapasis Mukherjee. Uh, and then of course we did uh, molecular response in our group to the Fox space couple, uh, um, multi-reference method. Lots of application compared to the related EMCC. So a lot of interesting work in the early days of multi-reference. Very recently, we also looked at uh, the low-scale many-body methods. So for example, equation of motion couple cluster method, how to develop an n to the power five scaling from n to the power six, and an interesting application to the water cluster electron de detachment. More recently, in last uh, couple of years, we have been working on development of partial fourth order triples. You, as you, all of you know that original developments were done by the singles and doubles. So we wanted to include triples, but uh, to the extent that, that they are fast. So they have reduced prefactors so that they can be applied to the large systems. We developed a few uh, methods in that. We call this A4, B4, and the full T star four. Of course, the star says that it is not exactly fourth order, Certain terms, which are already taken within the context of the couple cluster, they are summed up to infinite order. We tested the reliability of the results along with the computational efficiency. Uh, as I said, a very important part of the work was uh, to develop the resonance and decay problem in the complex absorbing potential. So we, our strategy was to make the Hamiltonian non-Hermitian by adding complex absorbing potential, but it allowed, although it's a non-Hermitian problem, once again, it allowed the solutions to be bound. So solutions to be square integrable, such that the quantum mechanical cal calculations can be applied. And with that in mind, we actually use the couple cluster method. Uh, we described the shape resonance, OJ decay, interatomic Coulombic decay, and very recently, excited state resonance of SO2 anion. This is very interesting. Uh, paper is there where the SO2 ground state is bound, but the SO2 anions can have a resonance state. So one of the first uh, applications to the excited state resonance is something that we did. Again, lots of papers that we published in very recent years, uh, which uh, I have just mentioned here. So those were basically uh, using couple cluster for resonance. And uh, we worked also on the relativistic uh, couple cluster method. So one of the uh, workers, uh, apart from our group, of course, the very pioneering work has been done before. In fact, Tron Sai, who is actually present in the audience today, he has done a lot of work on the relativistic couple cluster method. Uh, we have also looked at the spin-orbit coupling. 
uh, we looked at the ionization again. We have used most of the time we have used equation of motion methods, electron affinity. We use electron uh, double ionization potential again by equation of motion couple cluster method. PT odd interaction, electric magnetic properties, identification of mercury hydride with high dipole moment. Many interesting work we did on the relativistic works. And I must thank all of my students. Of course, I'm going to do that at the end because you know it's a it's a kind of a development which requires coding. And many of my students have done very high degree of coding. Uh, so I think that's very important to understand. Of course, many of you know that the relativistic methods have very different symmetry and it requires really good people, good students to go. I've been blessed with some of the very good students at, at one point of time and, and, and I continue to get, so I must thank all of them. So the relativistic couple cluster is of course very, very important because we are able to describe uh, that, uh, properties in a very accurate manner. So this is what we have been doing very recently. I want to again end this part by saying highly correlated electronic structure theories, uh, which we say right results for the right reasons. And that's very important. We should not end up getting a right result for a wrong reason. So several re relativistic couple cluster theory, then we have done bound state methods for the decay. These are two of the major work that uh, in terms of the quantum chemistry that we have been doing. Of course, these are not the standard quantum chemistry because this is the resonance state and even the standard quantum chemistry is actually non-relativistic. This is more in the physics area that we have been working. I will change gear to the second part, but I must say that we have been working on the material science, but here we are not developing methods. We are using density functional theory to predict properties. That has been also very fascinating to me that the, that the same quantum chemistry can today be used in a very predictive manner. So again, I showed this before. I'm going to only go directly to some of the work like gold cluster, aluminum cluster, and so on, and a little bit about the hydrogen storage. So a few interesting results in the gold and silver cluster. Again, here, I will only tell the outcomes. And the methods are, of course, DFT. I must say here that we have done mechanisms in many cases to find out how the clusters are, the, the catalysis cat clusters are catalyzing the reactions. So one of the interesting catalysts that we looked at was a small gold and silver cluster, which are hydrogen atom chemisol. Interestingly, these systems are actually being experimentally synthesized today. And we, show, we, we showed that compared to the, to the native gold and silver cluster, if you do a simple hydrogen atom chemisorption, the oxygen activation is very good and that allows CO oxidation to take place. In fact, CO oxidation has been our hobby problem. Uh, oxidative addition of CI on aluminum nanocluster. Al aluminum nanoclusters are used for oxidative addition of the CI bond. One of the interesting clusters, again, is the endohedrally doped gold nanocages. I will show some of this result again. Radical attached aluminum cluster. And a very interesting uh, catalysis that we have found is an aluminum cluster on a boron nitride doped graphene. This has a very promising result for dinitrogen activation. And I must say, again, I am not very sure if such a catalyst can be synthesized, uh, but the computationally, uh, it, has, it has shown very good promise on a graphene, you put B and dope, and then you put aluminum clusters. Uh, we have, of course, been generally doing a lots of catalyst designing. And of course, I must mention that the catalyst design requires several things. Today, if you are looking at organometallics, you want metal selection, you want ligand selection, solvent, reagents, so all of these actually have to be taken care of. In fact, I must dare say that this is where artificial intelligence and machine learning can play a very big role in the catalyst design. So one of the things that we have been doing also is a CO2 activation on, with using a homogeneous catalysis, which probably needs to be heterogenized for use of industry. So we have been looking at formic acid, to the format, and this has been a very interesting work that we have done very recently. This is uh, the last year, in fact, 2021. This is also 2021. There is an anniversary special issue which has come up. Many of you might be knowing. Uh, so we published this paper on iron PNN pincer complex. Uh, in the I think this should be iron three uh, pincer complex of uh, 
So this is PNN and so this is iron two PNN and this is NNN tensor complex in the hydrogenation of carbon dioxide to methanol. We have also looked at the manganese NNN pincer complex on carbon dioxide activation. So these, I, we believe that again, these are complexes which have a lot of promise and which we like to take forward. We have been working on metal clusters, I already told you, and some of the examples I just want to take, give. For example, if you have a gold cluster AU18, this is a pristine gold cluster, and we are looking at a COO2 oxidation reaction, you can look at the transition barriers. They're quite high. And as soon as you put metal dope like sodium, potassium on the same gold uh, cage, magnesium or calcium, all the activation barriers go down. So again, our message is that if we can put on this uh, gold, A18 gold cage, uh, sodium, these metals, and I believe some of them would be easy to do like magnesium, uh, calcium, I'm not very sure about sodium and potassium in terms of synthesis. Uh, this will actually help the uh, carbon, carbon uh, the oxidation reaction. So as you can see, we have actually done a lot of complete reaction mechanism and looked at all the intermediates and transition state. Uh, another very interesting work was a, again a pristine gold cluster. And I told you about this. If you look at the oxygen activation, you can see it's uh, just 1.23 angstrom. The binding energy is just 0.25, 0.31. But as soon as you put hydrogen chemisorption, one can see that the bond is elongated from 1.3 to 1.32, and the binding energy also increases. So that basically, it activates the oxygen molecule, and eventually that facilitates the CO oxidation reaction. If you look at the entire barrier, it's very instructive to see that with AU6, you have a 0.721 EV barrier, with AU8, you have 1.193 EV, but as soon as you do hydrogen chemisorption, this almost becomes barrierless. And even here, the barrier drops out. So one atom, and this is the very interesting part of a, a, of a cluster catalysis, that is just a simple, single atom. Putting a sing, simple, single atom changes everything. Uh, we have been very recently working on the lithium and sodium ion battery. This is a very recent work on application of DFT to the performance of the anode materials in particular. And we are looking at the molybdenum sulfide, lithiated uh, molybdenum tungsten sulfide, strain mediated several one, hack phosphorus, uh, square MOS2, strain on blue phosphorin, several different uh, methods we have actually looked at. And we have found very interesting uh, properties. I must just quickly highlight that the, the, the molybdenum is very good in terms of the uh, adsorption, but if you want to get all the properties right, then you need tungsten so that you, we, we, we suggest that a bal the alloy is a good uh, material to use for lithium storage. We did a lot of strain engineering in, in the blue phosphorine. Again, it's a promising material for achieving structural phase transition. The vacancy improved the specific capacity of molybdenum sulfide, so we designed nanostructural defects. And that is also a very interesting way. So several work that we have been doing, some of them are listed here. Uh, I, I should say this strain is very important. Very recently, we have looked at a tri-layer heterostructure between blue phosphine, MOS2, and graphene. And we found that they display strong mechanical thermal properties, the high lithium binding energy, and short diffusion distance. This is very important the barrier of diffusion also should be very good. Uh, so we looked at 2D molybdenum sulfide and molybdenum selenium, uh, lateral interfaces, and they provide multiple binding sites, the high adsorption energy and a large theoretical capacity. So of course, it's, it would be very interesting to you know, look at the performance among all these and to come up with a material which is the most promising material. I hope we'll be able to do that at this point of time, we have been working on several materials and it would be interesting to collaborate with experimentalists to actually find out which of the material would be a very good anode material for the battery. Uh, I will, I more or less said this. Uh, I should now uh, go to a final application and that is basically the hydrogen storage where again, I'm not going to speak much about it, but just the issues where I've already taken uh, the time that was allotted, almost 40 minutes. 
uh, hydrogen storage materials must follow certain rules. What is a good onboard hydrogen storage material? They should have, of course, a high binding energy in hydrogen. But at the same time, they must be able to dehydrogenate. And the kinetics of the dehydrogenation must also be very high. We, we can look at physisorption and chemisorption, very standard models of adsorption, but both of them are not ideal. Because in the physisorption material, you don't have a high binding energy. In the chemisorption materials, it's very hard to dehydrogenate. So one has to look at how to change both physisorption and chemisorption property by doping. So the doping is a very standard means in the material science. So we have looked at metal organic framework, which is a physisorption material. We have looked at magnesium, which chemisorbs hydrogen well, and we have looked at what is the best thing. And among the many of the works that we have done, I can only say because of lack of time, the most promising candidate is a scandium dope MOF5. Of course, there are many MOFs, so one can even get various other materials, but the MOF5 is what we have studied, along with ZIF. ZIF, as all of you know, zeolitic imidazole framework, and MOF is metal organic framework, ZIF7. If you put scandium dope, uh, that is very good. One of the reasons people is to actually put titania dope. Titania was very well known for doping, but the titania atoms started clustering among themselves. So there is a titania-titania bond, which did not allow the MOF or the ZIF to absorb a large amount of hydrogen. Scandium do not cluster, and this is something that we have analyzed in our calculations, and that is the reason scandium doping worked out very good. At the end, uh, before I finish, let me give the outlook. Where do we stand? and where do we go? Of course, today we claim that we can give you a fundamental insights with some debate. It's a debatable claim from an atomic and a molecular level to nano and bulk. So we can actually use, I have not talked of the nano and the bulk, uh, but you can use uh, mesoscopic simulation, atomistic simulation, and you can actually dis describe this. But the fundamental insights come from the quantum mechanics. There are many theoretical methods, as I told you, which combine a different length scale, and I showed the slide. And this is basically the idea of what is called the multi-scale simulation. Many of you have heard multi-scale simulation. This is very important. And we can combine in the same method, in the same system, depending on what we want. And that is exactly the method, which is called the QMMM method, uh, I already mentioned that as a Nobel Prize winning work in 2013, but a part of the active part is really quantum mechanics, the rest is uh, atomistic, the long range part. Interconnection really gives a very good insight. And we also now looking at the intermediate length scale, useful intermediate length scale, so that it gets, we can describe the novel properties in the function. What are the path forward? Despite all development, we are still grappling for large systems. As soon as you come to large systems, we are using DFT, which is good, but which is still debatable. Its accuracy is debatable. Can we use ab initio methods for large systems? And this is a challenging question. Many people are actually using fragmentation methods. So this is one approach that I must mention, not that the work is not being done. And various low scale, simulation methods. I, I, I'm not going to say only quantum mechanics, but low scaling, uh, which are lower low independent. Using many of these, the challenge is really to do a de novo design of materials, because today we have come a long way. Our job as a computational chemist is not to just explain what experimental is there, but actually to a de novo design of materials. So it's very, very important. And, and um, I, when I say materials, it could be also molecules, molecules and materials. So that's a very big challenge. The strong correlation. In fact, this I must say, strong correlation is a very big problem in both molecules and solids because only way we know to do a strong correlation is to do really full CI. And uh, I must explain to those who not understand, the strong correlation is basically a feature which comes from a large static correlation. So once you have a large amount of static correlation, you really have to take a linear combination or a configuration interaction, and this is becoming a big challenge for large molecules. One of the paths that will help us is to graph the ideas of artificial intelligence and machine learning. In fact, many papers you are seeing 
where AI and ML are being used along with this quantum mechanics. And one of the important part is to form material genomics. So knowledge of materials, we must have a database of material from where we can actually experiment that this can take a lot of clues. So the challenges are, I just list them all of them down, multi-scale simulation, hard and soft matter, machine learning to handle material genomics. And also, as I told you, catalysis design, because these are a huge number of parameters to play with. Identification of molecules for drug design and new functional materials in the renewable energy, improvement of exchange correlation functional in TFT. I think this is still a very challenging problem, which I must mention. So we can go from fundamental science, computing science and generation of technology. And that is a really a very big thing to dream. But can we go from fundamental science to technology? And I think many people are looking at that. The fundamental science poses problem on strong correlation itself. Can we look at it from ab initio as well as DFT point of view? And for large systems, can you do highly accurate and highly correlated quantum chemical methods? And these are very important for the fundamental science. Development of efficient computer codes, again, for complex, complex system and strong correlation. One of the major problems in fundamental science, I did not mention about this dynamics, is a non-adiabatic dynamics. And non-adiabatic dynamics, as many of you know, particularly quantum dynamics, is done only for very, very small systems. So this is going to remain a very big challenge. Again, I did not mention, because I am not, our group is not working on this. But I can now list down all the challenges. And I've listed down some of the challenges in terms of application on the left. But these are from the fundamental science. But eventually, with the fundamental science, good computer code, AI and ML, we can uh, look at helping the technology. I mean, that is the dream that the computational chemists have. And that is where I will end my talk. Uh, I must acknowledge, again, it's very hard to list down all the students. I must say, I have uh, 40 odd PhD students, various postdocs, starting from NCL Pune, IIT Bombay, and now a few from ISA Kolkata, and many collaborators. Uh, one or two I mentioned, uh, many collaborators uh, uh, who have been helping, particularly on the catalysis work that I already mentioned, and the funding from various sources, from SCRB, DST, Center for Development of Advanced Computing in India, Indo-European, I'm very happy to have one Indo-European project. I must also mention a couple of Indo-Mexico projects. I'm very sorry that I've not written it. Indo-Mexico project, DST, DRD project, Indo-French Center, couple of projects, various exchange programs with Slovakia. I can remember Slovakia uh, and so on. And I think I've been blessed with several funding over the years which I thought we should acknowledge. Uh, and without that, that could not have been done. SCRB, of course, have been a great source and they have been funding even today on one very major project on imprint. And of course, my own Jesse Bose Fellowship, uh, which is continuing for quite long time, which has been continuing over the years. So I'm, I'm very grateful to all my funding agencies. With that, I think I will thank all of you for patiently listening. And if there are questions, I will take them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pal, for this wonderful talk. And again, uh, the audience must have enjoyed it. So before moving into the Q&A session, we'll have a quick poll for the audience. It will take a few minutes. So I'll start the poll for the audience. Here we launch it. And yes, here is it. So there are three questions after attending the ACS Science Talk. How likely are you to recommend it to any of your colleagues, publish in an ACS journal, join the new membership with ACS? Are you attending ACS Science Talks for the first time? Yes or no? And how did you hear about ACS Science Talks you are attending in any of the mediums that has been mentioned here? So I'll wait for the responses for a couple of seconds. So I'll begin the countdown now. It's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I'll close this.
thank you so much for your responses and we'll share the results for the audience to look at and it's great to see that 67 percent of the audience would like to recommend this hcs size talk to other colleagues and great to see 58 percent of the people joining us in this session for the first time and again we can see emailers are the best mode of communications followed by the website so thank you so much